another edition of a political scope. We're continuing to examine what may possibly be the most um, topical issue in Guyana, that is amendments to the anti-money laundering and countering the financing for terrorism uh, bill. Of course, that bill would have been in the National Assembly last year. Uh, since early last year, we all know what happened at, um, in November when it was voted down. It was retabled again late last year, um, and it's still before a special selected committee. I have with me here the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and of course a director on the board for the Private Sector Commission, uh, Mr. Clinton Orling. Mr. Orling, welcome to the program. Good evening. Um, like I said in my preamble, this is the topical issue as it relates to what is happening in Guyana, not only um, from a business side, but um, everyday life, because when, when you examine clearly what um, the anti-money laundering um, legislation is about, you understand how deep it's going to dig as it relates to the average man. Yeah. Um, we know the developments that would have taken place over the, the past year or so as it relates to this bill. Um, what is the feeling, though, in the business community? Having seen what happened in November, it was voted down, it was retabled, sent back to a special select committee, no agreement, and so forth. What is the feeling in the, in, in the business community? Edward, the implications are great, um, both domestically and internationally. From an international standpoint, we're talking about the critical foreign direct investments that are needed to fuel Guyana's economy, and locally for all business people, who invest in the development of the local economy. Um, what is important to note, businesses depend on stability. Businesses plan. Uh, if an investor is looking at a particular country or geographic area or any constituency, he or she wants to know what are all the parameters within this country affecting the country's development, what the economic environment looks like. All these indications tell an investor whether or not they should set up their shops or their businesses in that geographic area. Looking at Guyana from a, a perspective of an investor, with the uncertain, uncertainty surrounding the way Parliament has been operating since 2011, after the general elections in 2011, and in particular with this anti-money laundering bill, it leaves the situation or the environment in a state of suspension and uncertainty that any rational business investor looking to come to Guyana would think twice or rethink their investment options when it comes to Guyana. And some might just uh, give up on the, the plans completely or some might divert to other countries or other territories where there's a more secure and a more, uh, a more secure and consistent environment for them to do so. And with all these changes announced, oh, only day before yesterday, someone was telling me a major airline was looking at investing in Guyana, a major one from the US, and then they expressed serious concerns behind the lack of the passage of the anti-money laundering bill. Because all that seems to get out today in the media and the press when a foreign investor looks at Guyana is issues of meeting the deadline of the, uh, the blacklisting. And if that blacklisting happens, especially if those, co if those companies are coming from countries uh, who are members of CFATF or FATF, uh, there's grave implications for them, Certainly. especially when it comes to them investing their capital and returning their capital back home to their home base and their countries at, at, in their home base. Um, it makes it extremely difficult for those companies to want to come here once you have that state of suspension and, and uncertainty surrounding the passage of the bill. Uh, domestically, um, the existing businesses that we have here, some are already feeling some of the effects because with this news getting out, Financial, for instance, the bankers, some bankers and some companies are already reporting some increased requirements from their other intermediaries overseas. Banks, for instance, the correspondent banks in the U.S., for instance, are already asking for more uh, an increased uh, scrutiny of, of any transaction coming from Guyana. So they're already, some are already uh, experiencing uh, additional hurdles in terms of completing transactions. Uh, currently, and if the blacklisting goes into full effect, well, then we will be in some serious uh, trouble. Uh, then, which which could potentially wipe out a large section of the economy and even eviscerate some of the growth we've seen over the years. Um, from from more from the private sector perspective, because I know um, investors, especially foreign investors, may want to the first thing to do, apart from um, doing the recce on the ground and so forth, would want to get into contact with the 
private sector organization here to hear from them in terms of the atmosphere. Have you been getting any feedback from some of those investors as it relates to Guyana's current standing, um, not here nor there with the anti-money laundering and the blacklisting? Have you been getting any feedback from them? When we meet investors, um, investors, because they're expending, we're talking sometimes millions of dollars in capital. So they, they are very careful and they do very thorough research. So when by the time they come to us at the private sector um, organizations, they already are aware of some of the, the main issues affecting it. From us, they try to get the perspective in terms of how do we feel or how optimistic are we um, as leaders of the private sector organizations in Ghana in terms of, in, uh, in terms of our government and our parliament passing the um, requisite legislation so that it would not affect their investment if they are to invest in the short or the long term. Uh, most of them are expressing grave concerns. As a matter of fact, uh, to me, the biggest threat from the feedback, because almost daily I meet with foreign investors or someone looking to come and invest, they'll come at the Chamber of Commerce. And the number one threat seems to be the uncertainty, not just with this bill, but the political uncertainty now that we see with um, that's happening in Parliament um, and things with the budget cuts. Um, programs that were earmarked um, as developmental projects that a year ago the entire parliament says you have our blessings for instance the airport expansion plan and then a year later you hear no we're cutting the funding for the airport expansion plans no investor wants to see that kind of uncertainty because if you if you're given a guarantee an upfront guarantee you'll say i'll invest now because this is a great opportunity and then a year later your investment is in jeopardy because those guys are changing uh, they are, they're changing the tune they're singing in the parliament, and that creates a lot of um, disquiet and discomfort with people looking to invest in Ghana. So it's a very you, serious issue. Do you think the National Assembly really, really has the, the interest of Guyanese at heart based on what is coming out from there? Um, I've said over the years they, they should have, and I want to still believe that they do. And I'll say, I'll be optimistic and say that our parliamentarians, um, by nature, um, if you want to represent the country, would not want to harm the country's best interests. But, uh, Edward, I can tell you, um, as the days go by, I become more and more cynical. Cynical of the, um, the way the, uh, the parliamentary, bo all sides, both sides, they've been operating on a number of these issues and the lack of them um, offering some space for political compromise and political accommodation so that they can reach at the center on positions. Um, democracy is not easy. Even, even the objections that the opposition would raise, it's not unique. Because in every, most democracies, there's always a give and take and, and trade-offs. Um, so in that sense, with both sides not trying to, to come to those amicable solutions, no, they don't have the country's best in, interest in those, in those instances. Um, but I still believe at the end of the day, they'll do the right thing. I, I want to take you to more the more um the more topical issue mm -hmm. within the anti money laundering and that has to do with the the amendments that are on the table at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Um based on the understanding and, 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 and the information that is coming out, um one gets the impression is that these amendments are not directly linked to what uh CFATF recommendations are, but more to the, the, the parent bill, if you wanna call it that. But uh, Put that aside and, and let us look at the, the amendments, um, the merits of the amendments. One has to do with giving the police and customs uh, powers to seize uh, monies that you may have over a certain amount. Um, and if, the, if, if in the judgment of the police and customs officers, they think that well, you know, you're involved in something, you, you seem suspicious. What, what is your take on, on Edward, I have to force, I'll, I'll say I'm happy that the... Um, they combine the opposition, um, in this case the APNU, because we've been meeting with all the political players on this issue. The amendments as is, and this is not the principle that, um, re, uh, was, present, that was presented by the government, received the endorsement of the AFC, the Alliance for Change. At least they told the private sector that. And they were okay with the bill, uh, as is. So the only, the only party that had an objection was the APNU. And we were given assurances that the APNU wanted to make their amendments at the subcommittee level, line item by line item, to make the necessary adjustments. And we were frustrated that the AP and you could not have
given us any specifics in terms of what they wanted to see in that bill. And we're talking about months ago, when we missed the first deadline, we went in and we talked and we said, what is it exactly you want to see amended um, from the amendment bill? But I'm happy, even though the, the current amendments that were made last week, they addressed the Principal Act, I'm still happy that they've presented something. And with that something, it gives both sides something to work with. If I agree with what they've proposed, that's another story. And if I touch on, I'll touch on the, the seizure aspect which you spoke about, yeah. which empowers um, law enforcement agencies, the police force, or a police officer that specifically states, on a, or a customs officer, gives them the authority to seize currency from any Guyanese or any citizens. And, and in this case, when we say currency, according to the law, it includes not just ca it includes cash, but it also extends to things like gold and jewelry, which is, mm -hmm. is, is considered currency. Um, those are enormous powers to transfer to any um, law enforcement officer uh, for them to to seize any property from any citizen. And it is something that um, we put to our membership at the George Strong Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I can tell you unequivocally, we had maybe one person um, just had some additional questions because they wanted to see what the legislation was, the proposed amendments were. But unequivocally, my members who responded to that email um, had an outright um, disapprovement or in disagreement in terms of that seizure clause being included or becoming law in Guyana. And primarily it was done on a few grounds and the principal and the primary one that came from the membership was the lack of trust and the integrity of the Guyana police force to empower them, equip them with that power to seize from any citizen $2 million, which is an insufficient amount of money, $2 million, $2 million Guyana dollar, uh, anybody holding $2 million could easily be any transaction within the private sector, legal, legitimate transaction. A money laundering law seeks to ensure illicit uh, cash or currency is not used for the purpose of masking it under some legitimate enterprise. And I think launderers are looking, we're talking about significantly more in terms of the value of the money than 10,000 US to do so. Uh, so it creates opportunities for corruption within the police force even more. Because if the police officers stop someone with more than two million dollars, it would not even that money would not even be seized because the transaction could take place right there and then. A bribe being offered to the police officer, and there we have increased instances of corruption happening every day. Once somebody is found with over two million dollars, it also creates a, a significant burden on the the persons or the individuals who are found or the business who are found with that two million dollar. Now they have to, there's a time factor. They have to go to a court of law and prove that the funds were acquired legally. They also have to acquire the services probably of an attorney at law. So there's a cost factor, time factor, efficiency factor for them to, um, to recuperate that money. That entire process takes a long time. In terms of lodgement of the funds received, the police force, for instance, can easily say, and this happens um, when seizures happen legally now, um, instead of them recording, they receive $2.5 million, they'll just put $2 million was received. So right there, a citizen can lose over uh, a significant portions of their funds because the incorrect number or sum were lodged in that book. That creates a lot of issues and a lot of problems for the private sector. Again, $2 million, we look at many aspects of our economy. Look at the gold and diamond mining sector. The number one sectors are extractive industries and the gold sector in, in particular. We're talking someone who just went into their, their, their dredge and coming out with, with maybe a couple of ounces of gold, and that's $2 million. Some people wear jewelry, it's $2 million. $2 million worth. So a police or any law enforcement, those law enforcement officers identified can stop someone and legally tell them, um, re uh, possess their, 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 um, their earnings, their currency. For me, it also encroaches on people's human, human rights. I don't think a government should be empowered to say, how much money, especially in democracies, how much money someone should uh, be required to walk around with. Edward, another thing I want to touch on with this, there's alternative ways and mechanisms that could be um, put in place as opposed to some draconian um, law to the effect proposed by the APNU in this instance. You could easily, if you find me, Clinton Erling, uh, with over 10,000 US, and you have a suspicion, 
you record my information, my name, my address, my place of uh, where I live, and, and then you report that to the authority assigned under the Act, which is the Financial Intelligence Unit or the Customs and Excise, any one of those departments that have the responsibility to monitor money law. You report that to that relevant agency for them to initiate an investigation into that person who you find, but not to, te not to empower you to take away the monies from them. Um, for instance, also even in, in Barbados, the Barbados model, and many models around the world, you have to require um, the approval of a judge or a magistrate. You have to go to your judiciary, um, provide evidence on the oath that you suspect XYZ individual might be involved in some illicit money laundering scheme. And once the magistrate or the judge is satisfied with the evidence presented that there's the suspicion here and enough evidence to prove some form of money laundering is happening, then he or she instructs or uh, authorizes a warrant which gives the police or the security officials to go and seize and raid any premises and acquire evidence. That, be, that is something that we would more support. Um, or just recordings and send it to the relevant agency, in this case the FIU. Or if you, you really want to target money laundering and not the average citizen and $2 million, raise the, raise the amount of uh, money being proposed. Um, and at minimum, I'm talking about 150 to 200,000 US at minimum. That's for real money launderers and those who look into finance, terrorism. Those are the kind of cash you're supposed to be targeting. Vic, because the point was made in a previous program that um, forget the owner of the dredge. Think about the operator of his excavator who was in there for six months or so. Um, the, 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 the pay in there, the pay in there is very high, so he would be coming out maybe two, three million dollars, um, and there might not be any structured system to show that okay, I actually work in here on, except for the, yeah. the, the owner of the judge coming, the judge coming and say you know well yes indeed he was working with me. Um, the other issue that was raised too is, think about the average man who takes a loan from the bank and is building his house. He's going to get his material and so forth. Fine, he will be able to verify that this money indeed came from the bank for loan, but the, I think the, the, the key factor there is time. The inconvenience. The inconvenience. And it could be any, there's numerous, some, many examples. Some, so a family can send to you 8,000 US remittances, and you probably had a 2,000, 3,000 saved on your bed, you know, just because you don't have, the distance between the bank and where you live, it's too onerous. Whatever reason, you're a free citizen to decide how you want to dispose of your cash. And combine both of those monies amount to more than the $10,000. Now, you're in convenience. You now have to go and hire an attorney, and then you have to prove to the authorities that this money was acquired legally. Um, it's not efficient, and it's something that I don't agree with uh, and should be implemented. I, I'm, I'm going to take you over to the other um, proposal, which has mm -hmm. to do with the authority. Uh, constituting the FIU and that body proposed above the FIU. Mm -hmm. um, one of the concerns were that you having so many people um, deciding on who is going to be who in, in, in such a, a body um, and the issue of confidentiality, especially with the body has, uh, having the authority to, to, to maybe access certain personal um, financial information of persons. Your, your take on this? this okay. There, there's the proposal to establish an authority um, to overlook the FIU or to supervise, that's the language they use, the FIU. This is not a unique phenomenon. Um, as a matter of fact, the Barbady and the Bayesian model, um, their anti-money laundering, similar law, has an authority. And I think that's a good proposal that can work in Guyana's case. The authority in Barbados, um, it is staffed by those agencies already responsible for um, fi financial, um, in handling financial information. If you look at the Barbados model, there's the Commission of Insurance sitting on, or his or her representative sitting on that committee. The head of the equivalent of our GRA is sitting on that committee. You have three private sector representatives sitting on that committee, including the head of the Jamaica, the, the Barbados private sector organization, maybe in our case, maybe the PSC. Uh, the other two would be professionals from our private sector. In the Barbados model, there's the head of the University of West Indies. But in Guyana, we can create, we can use those same constitutional offices, and these guys would have information because it makes sense in the sense in terms of sharing of information between these relevant. You have the central bank governor, his or her rep, all those type people 
ex officio type people sitting on that authority. That can work. I think one of the issues here uh, might be is how the proposed amendments intend to set up that body. I think here they want to transfer the power from the minister or the executive to the judiciary, uh, the legislature, where the parliamentarians decide those ten names. I think uh, that model could uh, we can run into some trouble if we try to use that model because if we've seen the impasse over over establishing every commission and committee in this country in parliament, and to put individuals that uh, po political appointees to overlook a process is not in keeping with the practices of um, establishing these type money laundering legislation. It's palpable once we have those agencies already um, um, involved, sitting um, on those committees and running. In the case of Barbados and, for instance, in Trinidad, the power still resides within our, the minister, the subject minister, in this case is the minister of finance, to appoint those appointees. And then the parliament role is to, at the end of the year, review the reports from the Financial Intelligence Unit uh, and to ensure that the work and the functioning is, is, is being carried out the way it should be. And I think um, I think that's the preferable model because if we have a, an authority stacked with political appointees who themselves should be a subject of the investigation, who could be the subject of the investigation from the NY, it creates a, a very serious conflict of interest. And, and, and there will be the issue of confidentiality because um Remember, you have those. You have so many persons um, appointing in the first place, exactly. and you have so many persons being involved in the process. Because I think my understanding of what is happening is not just uh, oversight, basically, mm. but it's to have more of a hand, not in the day-to-day -day running of 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 the. Um, but they receive all the reports, from reports, the and so forth. So you have issues of confidentiality and so forth. But uh, Mr. Orling, your call. I know. I know you're very passionate about this. Um, you want to see this uh, get um, through Parliament so that the, the, the country can get back on, on good footing in terms of um, being removed from that uh, list of countries to be blacklisted. Um, what is your call to, to, to politicians? Edward, um, politician, the current dispensation, I think, has created um, a belief within the Parliament that every issue now should reside, every major issue pertaining to Guyana should reside within the parliament, the legislature. Guyana still has what you call a presidential system, where the executive um, has a significant role and a significant say. He or she still is the um, elected representative of all the people. Uh, unless we change our system constitutional, that could only be done if we manipulate and change the constitution. I think our parliamentarians need to respect the role of the presidential system that we have until we, un, unless they're willing to change the system into a parliamentary type system where all the major issues are debated uh, in parliament and the prime minister is, or the president or prime minister is required to attend the parliament. I think that's the first. You have to understand and respect that process. And once that process is respected, um, all our politicians have to realize that Guyana's best interests should be the only interest and not their party or the partisan or the personal interest. And I think once that realization starts to happen, you'll see on both sides a coming together of positions because they'll soon realize um, over the past three years, we're going into three years now, we've had, um, it's all confrontation and conflict. There's no compromise and no results. And I think um, at some point, either they agree to do that or we look at maybe returning to the polls and see if the outcome would change. And if the outcome returns us back to this situation, then Edward, we have a different discussion in terms of looking at some inclusionary type approach to governance in Guyana. Uh, Mr. Orling, I, I want to thank you very much for joining me uh, this evening um, to discuss this issue, which I think, like I said in the beginning, um, is something that is touching every single Guyanese. So I want to thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. And I want to thank you very much for joining us at home. Have a good rest of the evening.